Here at Flight Insight, we spend a lot of time thinking about why pilots fail check rides. One of the biggest shortcomings in training, both for private pilots, but also for any other rating, is knowing what to do about inoperative equipment in your aircraft. The simple question, is my aircraft airworthy, has a complicated answer, as shown by this new decision tree we've drawn up, which you can get a free copy of using the link shown here or in the video description below. Most of us learn about basic instrument and equipment requirements laid out in 91205 and 91207, using acronyms like A Tomato Flames or Grab Card. But notice that that item doesn't show up in our decision tree until the bottom, at the end of a cascade of several other questions depicted in blue that we need to first address. Let's go through this methodically then. The first thing is we discover an inoperative item during our pre-flight of the aircraft. We've cited 91.7 here. This reg states that we can't fly an aircraft unless it's airworthy and that it's the pilot and command's responsibility to determine if it's safe for flight. It's not up to the mechanic, aircraft owner, or your instructor who's not going up with you. It's up to you, the pilot. So once we've found an item that's not working, we need to figure out if it's going to ground us. First, we're going to see if this item is on what's called a minimum equipment list, or MEL. We'll reference 91213 quite a bit in this exercise as it deals with inoperative equipment. Except as provided in paragraph D, which we'll get into a bit later, we can't take an aircraft into the air that doesn't have an approved MEL. What's an MEL? It's an FAA document which lists what kinds of operations, if any, can be performed by a specific aircraft with certain equipment inoperative. Most basic GA aircraft don't have MELs, which is why most of us in training aren't familiar with them. You could see if your aircraft has an MEL by looking it up on the FAA database here. It would also be something you as the aircraft owner would have. We've provided a link to it in the PDF you can download, or you could just Google FAA Dynamic Regulatory System. We choose MMELs and then filter for a specific model. The Piper Seminole, PA-44, is a great example of a relatively basic aircraft with an MEL. Many of us do our multi-engine training in that aircraft. These tend to be long documents, but what we're looking for is this part here. We're looking at the equipment in the first column showing cockpit shoulder harnesses. The next column shows the number installed, two. The third column shows the number that are required for airworthiness, just one. And then the fourth column has a note. The right side harness can be in-op as long as no one's sitting in that seat. That's a bit more detailed than the basic A tomato flames from 91205, which just says that seat belts are required. So the MEL provides some relief here to allow us to sometimes fly an aircraft with something not working. That's an important point. It shows us what can be broken and still leave us airworthy. It doesn't show every piece of equipment required to be on board. Please don't try to fly the Seminole without ailerons just because you won't find them on the MEL here. So having gone through the MEL, if there is an MEL, we decide that the in-op item isn't required. We go on to our next question. Is the item required by something called the Type Certificate Data Sheet, or TCDS? This references 91213D21. Remember, we said we'd be referencing this paragraph D, so here it is. We can take an aircraft up without an MEL as long as we're flying in one of the category or class aircraft listed, for example, a non-turbine powered airplane, and the in-op equipment is not part of the type certification requirements. Remember that all aircraft have type certificates from the FAA. We can look up the specifics of this certification on their website again, this time finding TCDS. Let's look up a Cessna 172 Sierra this time. If we scroll down to the S model, we see some equipment information. If this looks familiar, it's because it's in sections 1 and 2 of your POH, showing information like engine and propeller models that are required for the 172. If the spinner is broken, the aircraft is unairworthy, per this data sheet. So our Cessna 172, which doesn't have an MEL, will reference these items in paragraph D of the reg, starting with that data sheet. Next, we'll look to see if the equipment is on what's called a Kinds of Operations Equipment List, or KOEL. It's referenced in the reg right after the reference to the type certificate data sheet. These lists can have different names, but they're found in the POH or airplane flight manual. Here's a KOEL in section two of the POH for a Cirrus SR-22. In the section on ice and rain protection, it lists that a working alternate engine air induction system and alternate static air source are required for all operations, VFR and IFR day and night. You won't find a KOEL in the POH for older 172s, but you will find this equipment list in section 6 for the 172 PAPA. Some letter codes are described at the bottom. An R means an item is required. Turning a few pages, we see an item number with an R suffix, E93R. 
This is the heating system. The note shows that carburetor heat is a required item. If it's not working, the aircraft isn't airworthy. So check this list in the POH to see if your in-op item is listed here as required. If, after having gone through it, we don't find that it's required, we can move on to any supplemental type certificate that might require it. An STC is issued for new equipment or instruments installed in the aircraft which weren't covered in the initial type certification. Once again, these can be found on the FAA's site, but you should reference the STC you actually have with your aircraft. This STC is for some Garmin GTN GPS units such as the GTN 750. Just like some aircraft, the GTN has a kinds of operation equipment list. This one says that if you're using the GTN for primary navigation and IFR operations, you must have an external HSI, CDI, or EHSI. This would be like the VOR head paired to the GPS. If that's not working, you can't go up an IFR relying primarily on the GPS. Having satisfied the STCs, we move on to see if the equipment is mentioned on any airworthiness directives for our aircraft. This is the last thing mentioned in paragraph D of 91213. Anyone flying Cessna 172s should be familiar with this well-known AD showing that the seat rail apparatus should be inspected and replaced to prevent the seat sliding back in flight. If that's not working, the aircraft should be grounded. Finally, after having satisfied all those questions, we move on to the familiar 91205 and 207. 205 lists first the required equipment for daytime VFR, a tomato flames with an assist from 207 on the ELT, nighttime VFR, an IFR flight, grab card. Anyone answering that looking at these lists alone for whether an in-op piece of equipment is cause for grounding is not giving a complete answer. All the other lists we mentioned can either provide some relief from these requirements, such as the right side harness in the seminal we saw in the MEL, or provide greater restriction, like the car beat requirement for the 172 PAPA. We need to work through this whole exercise. If, having gone through all these, we find our in-op equipment is not required, we can deem our aircraft airworthy. 91213D 3 and 4 require us, though, to disable our equipment and placard it as in-op or to just remove it. We should make a maintenance log entry and, as always, as PIC, make a final determination that the aircraft can be operated safely without this equipment. We also should plan to service the broken item as quickly as possible. As we've mentioned, if we answered yes to any of the questions of whether the in-op equipment is required, we need to ground the aircraft. We may be able to get a ferry permit under certain circumstances in order to fly the aircraft to a maintenance facility to fix it. So here's our full decision tree on inoperative equipment, which will work for both your check rides and your whole life as pilots. Note that this decision tree is based very closely on one created by the FAA in an advisory circular on inoperative equipment, AC91-67 you may have heard of, but that has been canceled and the regs have changed slightly, so this will work going forward. Again, feel free to download a free copy of this for yourselves at the link here or in the description below. Happy flying!